this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for week number one of the 2020 NFL season, breaking down the best bets on the board with J.J. Zacharyson, editor-in-chief of NumberFire and FanDuel, also talking some player props with J.J., which should be a blast as always. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Make sure you check out the pick report as well. Ed, week one has finally arrived. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Excited about a full week of NFL football and seeing what these teams that I've been uh, studying over the last month are finally going to do on the football field. And then, you know, those four ACC conference games that are also happening as well. Well, As long as they don't get postponed like the Big 12. (laughs) Yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll 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 be we'll be following it closely. So, uh, um, yeah, no, it's kind of unfortunate some of those Big Twelve games got uh, yeah. canceled already. Um, not a lot of headlines on those. No, I feel like I've been. I, I feel like I turn on Sports Center and check ESPN quite a bit just to see if the world has blown up, <laughs> or you know, my sporting world has blown up. Right. And <laughs> didn't see much about those, but um, yeah, clearly a lot of uncertainty. Hopefully, we'll get a little bit more certainty with the NFL. As they right. start playing games, hopefully not having positive kit, uh, test results, and uh, we'll have a full season. That would and be honestly, great. The NFL's kind of blown me away with how well things have gone so far. I know teams are kind of like in training camp bubbles, so like they're not out in the world as much. Um, they're not traveling and things like that. But right. the the number of negative tests they've had through the last month has exponentially increased my level of confidence that we get a full season in. Like, there's there are going to be bumps right. along the way. That's inevitable. Yeah. It's going to happen. But they've already exceeded my expectations, so I, I kind of feel a lot more optimistic than I felt the entire time, right. which is good because week one's here, and we get to watch some football uh, starting tomorrow night. Exactly. Yeah, let's harness that optimism. And, uh, yeah, obviously a great one with uh, yeah. KC and Houston on, on Thursday night. Yeah, that's a great way to kick things off. Two young, exciting quarterbacks who've just gotten paid in this offseason, so that should be a whole lot of fun. We're going to preview that game and more with J.J. Zacharyson. Find him on Twitter at LateRoundQB. As mentioned, he is the editor-in-chief at NumberFire and FanDuel. We're going to preview week number one. Also, talk through some player props that J.J. likes for this year that are still available at FanDuel Sportsbook. If you want to jam some in before things kick off, J.J. has a sterling record on this show so far. We had him on the preseason last year, he nailed his bets with who was going to lead the league in rushing that year. He mentioned Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb. They were 1-2 in the league in rushing. And also, we had him on before the Super Bowl to talk to prop bets there. He said Pat Mahomes was going to score the first touchdown at 20-1. to Pat Mahomes scored the first touchdown at 20-1. to So, JJ yeah. has a little bit of a reputation to live up to here on well, the show. Well, he, he had Mostert under rushing yeah. yard total in the Super Bowl as well, which, yep. which was great. Um, so yeah, JJ has a lot to live up to. So make sure you follow JJ on Twitter at late round QB and check out his podcast. Uh, the late round podcast, three shows, I believe per week over there as well. It does change in season, but, uh, check that out. Also, because we are now in season, do not forget to subscribe to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast. We'll be having uh, an interesting will play by year when it comes to trying to decide when to talk about college games and stuff like that. So make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Before we talk to JJ, we got to go back to last week because we had Megan Devine on to preview the Kentucky Derby. And Megan lived up to the JJ, uh, the JJ aura, I guess, because she gave us some good recommendations as well. So let's go through those and then get to JJ. Covering the past. All right, last week we had Megan Devine on to cover the Kentucky Derby. Follow Megan on Twitter at Megan Devine TV. Check her out on TVG. Check out her company, VidHorse, and also the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast. And Megan did give out Authentic as one of the horses that she liked for the Kentucky Derby at the time. Authentic was 10 to 1 at TVG. Actually closed at 8, at 8 to 1. So some closing line value there and did wind up winning, beating out a late charge by Tis the Law. I thought for sure Tis the Law was going to 
going to win that based on the momentum, but uh, <laughs> kudos to Authentic. And the reason that Megan was on Authentic was because she said that he had upside because he was a bit immature and had issues out of the starting gate, but she said as long as he could remain focused for that mile and a quarter, he'd have the ability to win the race. And that is exactly what happened. So kudos to Megan for pinpointing that. Uh, her favorite horse to win was Honor AP. Honor AP finished fourth in the race. King Guillermo was another horse she recommended, and he had to withdraw because of a sickness before the race. He was 20 to 1. But Hopefully you wound up on authentic, uh, the upside play there at eight to one or 10 to one, I guess at the time. So kudos to Megan for being all over that, embracing the risk within authentic to hopefully win you some money. And Ed, if, if you know that there's variance, but the, that horse can hit the high end of the variance, this is true in all forms of sports betting, go with the high upside play. If you know, they can hit that high range of the end of uh, high end of the range of outcomes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I was definitely telling the people that I was watching the race with about what Megan was saying. So that, that worked out pretty well with the the high variance horse. It was also interesting. I thought like kind of tis the law down the stretch. Like he was the one that got distracted. It almost like he like looked like he looked to the right and like yeah. missed the stride and then just could never recover. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I was, was like I was pulling for authentics. I knew that had, that Megan had talked about him. And I saw Tiz the Law, like he was in fourth initially, and then sort of climbing up. I was like, oh, man, dang it. Like, I was so excited right. that Megan was going to nail this. And then she did, because Authentic held him off. So uh, kudos to Megan. Again, follow her on Twitter, Megan Divine TV. Check out her work at TVG, Vid Horse, and also the Horse Racing Happy Hour. But uh, fun to have it there with Megan. So congratulations, and thank you to her for spreading that knowledge. We're going to talk to JJ in just one second. But first, football is finally here. And this is you can bet all the action on fans. FanDuel Sportsbook. And if you've never tried FanDuel Sportsbook, he, then here's something you won't want to miss. Right now, new users can get an exclusive plus 2,500 odds boost on Kansas City to win their Thursday night week one game against the Texans. You heard that right. You can bet $5 to win $125 on the defending champs in their first game. And with FanDuel Sportsbook, incredible odds are just the beginning. They've got a simple app, live betting on every game, and once you win, they get you your winnings in as little as 24 hours. So, if you've never tried FanDuel Sportsbook, it's time to get off the sidelines. Download the FanDuel Sportsbook app today and make your first deposit to claim your exclusive plus $2,500 odds or 2500 odds boost on the Chiefs to beat the Texans. 21 plus in present New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Colorado, West Virginia, or Indiana. New users only. Must wager on designated boost market. Deposit required. Max bonus 125. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or in Colorado, call 1 800 522 4700 in West Virginia. Visit uh, www.1800gambler.net or in Indiana, call 1 800 9 with it. We need one of those machines that speeds up my voice to read through all the disclaimers. Uh, maybe once we uh, we get some huge budget for the show, we'll get the, the, the speed booster for me, but not quite there yet. Eventually, we'll get there though. Let's get set for week number one now with JJ Zacharyson. Again, find him on Twitter at Late Round. QB. He is the editor in chief of Number Fire and FanDuel and the host of the Late Round Podcast. We are previewing week number one and talking player props with JJ Zacharyson. Covering the present. Let's bring JJ Zacharyson back into covering the spread. And JJ, you set the bar kind of high for yourself. So I don't know if you want to say something here to lower expectations for people. You know, I don't know, no, no, because no. I feel like you just set the bar way too high, but how are you doing today? I'm good. Look, we all we, we talk about regression all the time uh, with, with our analysis, and that's exactly what's going to happen uh, in my analysis, as opposed to just a player regressing. My analysis will regress. So I'm I'm expecting not, you know, I'll, I'll be more average because people sure. often overstate what regression means. They think that it means an overcorrection, but. Uh, really, I'm just back to my, my normal self, so I'll miss more than I did last year, I'm sure. Okay, so regression is coming. Life is just one big regression towards the mean, yada, yada, yada. Yes. We understand that. Uh, but it's week one, JJ, and it feels kind of weird, at least to me, because it seems like all of this has come out of nowhere. I'm not sure if it was because of pessimism around the season, but have you felt that in your analysis, too, where you've been kind of in scramble mode to get set for week number one because of the uncertainty? 
Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I like to have things sort of set up and ready to go in my spreadsheets that I can just kind of plug and play and, and go from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a different season for sure. You know, it's a, a season where when, when I'm building projections and looking at projections, uh, I might be taking a little bit more of a conservative approach because of uh, what we're dealing with in the environment that we're in. Um, you know, with football in, in, in particular, uh, you have a sport that naturally causes lots of injuries, right? So, uh, you know, we know that things can go sideways very, very quickly for individual players. And then obviously that turns into into individual teams. Um, but now we have this extra thing with the virus where, um, you know, we have to play into that in some way. But fortunately, in terms of projecting and predicting, um, it's something that's going to affect everyone. And we don't know. I mean, it's completely random as to how you know, in terms of from what we know, in terms of how it's going to affect individual people. So at least we can sort of have this like blanket way of looking at these players as opposed to with an injury. You know, there's one guy who might be slightly more injury prone than another guy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different dynamic than what we've definitely been used to in the past. Yeah. And I want to, we're going to get to week one, obviously, because that's the main reason we have you here to preview week number one from a betting perspective. But we also would be remiss if we didn't talk some player props with you. And you kind of alluded to this already, talking about, your process for this year with your player projections, you know, and there's, there's just less to go on. There's less information from training camps with restricted access and restricted reporting on training camps. There's no preseason games. So how has that changed things for you? Having less information on top of the uncertainty with like you were talking about with the potential for players to get sick and things like that. Yeah. I mean, I think the difference with no preseason is that, you know, in the past we're able to sort of see how these backfields uh, in, in particular, uh, let's say the running back backfields, because uh, that's something that's going to be more coaching decision dictated as opposed to talent dictated. Uh, but in the past, we've been able to see maybe what the rotation is going to look like in a backfield and what maybe uh, the, the, the snap share is going to look like in a particular backfield. Um, but, you know, we didn't get that this year. So we're, we're kind of going off of what we expect, you know, and what we would have expected historically in like late July, early August, once we get our projections done, none of that's really changing all that much aside from some reports here and there from beat writers. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing though, because I think that a lot of times with the preseason, we can sort of overestimate what uh, these particular players are doing and how that really shifts uh, the way that they're going to see targets and, and how they're going to be utilized in their backfields, what have you. Um, so I, I almost see it as almost a win because we're able to s stick with our process more and not deviate from it just by some random thing that we see in the preseason. Excellent, JJ. So last year, I uh, want to talk about the markets and some of these player props. Last year, I believe it was uh, Derek Henry and Nick Chubb that you nailed, um, which was awesome. Uh, please correct me if I got that wrong. But no, that's right. Yeah, awesome. So uh, you, we have all these markets for passing yardage, rushing yardage, receiving yardage. Any players that stand out in these markets? Yeah, so I, I looked at, uh, especially at running back, I think is really interesting. There's a lot of candidates, in my opinion. I, I think that, uh, you know, Joe Mixon and, and, and Miles Sanders and Josh Jacobs are all interesting bets. I, I think I like Joe Mixon the most at the running back position, who's plus 2,200 right now, which I think is about where Derrick Henry was last year around this time. Um, you know, Cincinnati might not be that great, and that's not great because we want these teams to be in positive game scripts which will then allow them to run the ball a little bit more. And last year, Cincinnati in neutral game scripts, not just overall. So Cincinnati was bad, so we would expect them to be a pass-heavy team overall. But even in neutral game scripts, they were they were one of the most pass-heavy teams in football. So they clearly want to throw the football, but this is still a new environment for this offense where you have a rookie quarterback. They might be a little bit more conservative. Um, so right now, Joe Mixon at plus 2,200, he's the 10th. Uh, he has the 10th best odds to, to lead uh, the NFL in rushing. Uh, but my model and my projections have him at seventh. So I think there's some equity to be gained there. I don't mind him. Um, and, and then, you know, the, the thing with Joe Mixon, too, to keep in mind is that rushing share and what he does on the ground has never been his issue. The issue is more his receiving numbers. Um, so you don't really have to worry about that that much uh, with, a, with a prop like that. And then I also think uh, Devontae Adams is a really interesting bet at plus 1,400 to lead the league in receiving. Um, I think he could easily lead the league in targets this year. Uh, there's not a lot of competition in that Green Bay offense. They did nothing over the offseason uh, to really add to that. They did get Devin Funches, and then he opts out. So there's there's really no competition for Devontae Adams. And then Green Bay last year, as we know, they were a very fortunate team. They won a lot of close games. They, they saw more positive game scripts than they probably should have. Uh, this is now a team who has a, a an over-under win total that's a lot lower than what we saw them finish with last year, which means that they might not be as run-heavy as 
people think. You know, if you look at all their moves, I mean, they they don't plan for the passing attack in the draft. They don't do anything in the draft for the passing attack. And then they get A.J. Dillon in the second round. Um, a lot of people will just automatically assume that they're going to be this very run heavy team. I think that they would ideally want to be that way, but I don't know if they're going to be able to do that as much as they want to. And as a result, Devonte Adams, who could see a 32, 33 percent target share in this offense because the weapons are so poor, I think he could lead the league in targets. And then as a result, he could lead the league in receiving. Yeah, Devontae yeah. Adams is especially interesting compared to Michael Thomas because Michael Thomas is like the other guy you point to as being someone who could have a 30% target share. Michael Thomas is 4-1, to one, and yeah. Devontae Adams is 14-1, to one, and that gap seems kind of hard to really understand. So I, I agree with the, the Devontae angle there for sure. If you can find someone who can get that type of market share at 14-1, to one, that's pretty hard to turn down. You were right about uh, Derrick Henry being... I think he might have been actually like 30 to 1 when we spoke because we spoke at like the end of July yeah. or middle of July. It was middle of July and he was 30 to 1 at then. I think he closed at like 16 to 1. So not only do you get the bet right, but there was also a lot of closing line value there too. Right. Uh, so Mixon 22 to 1. I think that is definitely interesting for Jim, sure. So let's keep an eye Jim, on that for sure. I just want to jump in real quick. Yeah. Just, I, I find it how hilarious that a team with Aaron Rodgers wants to run the ball more. Just <laughs> and I think that it's true, JJ. Um, yeah. I think that's an amazing statement, and, and they probably know better than any of us that 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 might be their best strategy given an aging quarterback. And then also, um, you know, I mean, I think Devontae Adams is going to probably get some more deep balls than Michael Thomas as well. Yeah. So if they have the same market share, uh, you know, Michael Thomas is going to be – you know, shipping away at those short ones, uh, Aaron Rodgers is probably going to be airing it out a little bit more, a little more ADOT uh, for the Packers. For sure. So make sure you check out those player props still up over at FanDuel Sportsbook before things close on Thursday night. Speaking of Thursday night, let's dive into our first game of week number one. That is the Texans at the Chiefs. Total here is 54 and a half. It's the highest total on week one. Uh, the Chiefs are nine point favorites. And this is a sky high total for the first game of the year. And it comes with no training camp, uh, no ramp up session, no preseason games or limited training camp. JJ, do you ever read either way on the total for this game, given how high it actually is? I mean, look, we saw these two these teams play against each other twice last year, once in the playoffs, once in the regular season. And in both of those games, they went over this total. Um, and, and so I'm a little bit intrigued by that, at least. I'm also a believer within these these week one games that we're going to see a lot of overs. Um, the only really seasonal comp that we have to this 2020 season where there's not a big ramp up period, it's not normal, is that 2011 season where there was almost a lockout, where they ended the lockout at the end of July. And in week one that year, uh, we only had four games go under. Uh, so I, I think that a lot of people get very fixated on uh, looking at offense and offensive situation when they're trying to decide where to go with a game, not only just because it makes sense, but also because of fantasy football. Um, but but really, you know, the, the cohesiveness of the defensive unit is arguably more important than the cohesiveness of the offensive unit because offenses know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're... It's, it's sort of the same logic that we use with snow games. People get all, all scared about, about offenses in the snow because uh, they're going to slip and fall and they're not going to have a grip on the football. But the offenses know where... The, the wide receivers know where they're going. The running backs know what holes to hit and, and what's going to be open, whereas the defenses have no idea. And so they're at a slight disadvantage from that perspective. I think it's sort of similar to what we're going to see here to start the season where defenses aren't together. You know, they haven't been tackling at all really throughout throughout August like they have historically. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of overs. And then in a game where you have Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes, you know, this this total is high. It's 54 and a half. But with those two quarterbacks, I don't think it's substantially high, especially given what we saw last year. So I think all that combined, I, I really like the over in this game. Excellent. Um, so the Chiefs are going to allow like 22,000 fans in this game. Uh, do you think that has any factor the, in the spread or uh, to maybe even in the total for you? I don't think it changes too much for me. Um, you know, I, I will say that I don't think that we should completely dismiss uh, home field advantage uh, with, without fans even. You know, I, I think there's something not only have we seen some something in soccer. I know that, that it's not as extreme, but there's at least some advantage to being at home. Um, but on top of that, you know, you have the environment, you have the the uh, the, the process that these individual players go through and, and the, the familiarity of the locker room and of the field, etc. So I do think that it still is going to matter in some way. Um, what's it going to be like when Arrowhead is more like a Los Angeles stadium this week? <laughs> I'm, 
I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I don't think that it's going to change my outlook that much. But I will say this. I have a much better read and feel, at least confidence-wise, on the over-under of this game versus the spread of the game. I think the spread is, is pretty pretty on point. Yeah, two things you discussed in there were the impact of travel still and um, the impact of uh, of having no camp on defense. We talked to Orlando Skandrick about that. He said both those exact same things. And a player would know the impact of travel, the impact of uh, not having fans, and the impact of not having that, that preseason. He said that it impacted the defense too. So sounds like you are on the same page as Orlando there, which seems to bode well. Let's move on to our second game here. This is on Sunday. The Packers at the Vikings, the NFC North battle. The total here, 45 and a half. The Vikings, two and a half point favorites. NFC North, pretty wide open. I think that's fair to say, uh, in part because neither the Vikings nor the Packers seem to want to win the division based on the way they did things this offseason. So what's your overall read on these two teams broadly entering the season? I don't know if they know what they want to do. Is, is yeah, how problem. can we even read on them if they don't read on themselves? Yeah, I mean, look, Green Bay, we just talked about it earlier. Green Bay seems to want to run the football. And look, Green Bay's defense is not bad. I think they have a fringe top 10 defense this year. And then Minnesota is probably a middle of the road defense at this point. Um, so so maybe as a result of that, they, they could, uh, both of these teams could run more run heavy uh, and, and, and be able to, to do that. Um, I'm just comparing the Packers. You know, earlier I compared the Packers to what they did last season. Um, I think this could be one of the few games, just given the fact that, you know, Aaron Rodgers' efficiency has dipped over the last half decade or so. Um, Kirk Cousins had a very, very efficient offense last, and was very, very efficient last year. But, um, you know, Kevin Stefanski's not there. We don't know what the impact that that's going to make on this on this offense as a whole. I think you can make the argument that this is one of the few games that you could go under. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I generally... You know, I don't like doing that necessarily when the two quarterbacks are at least capable and then we've seen them be capable historically. Um, so I don't I honestly don't have the strongest feel for this game because both teams just seem kind of erratic. Like they they don't match what they should be doing in today's NFL with their actions. Um, you know, we there's a lot of talk as to the Vikings locking up Dalvin Cook longer term and, and and that those kinds of moves and then obviously the AJ Dillon move, those kinds of moves just tell me that that they're not necessarily uh, thinking logically on the offensive side of the ball, which doesn't make me feel great about going over. Uh, so it's a game that I'm kind of avoiding for the most part with two teams that I think are a little bit directionless. Excellent. Let's move on to the Bucs at Saints uh, in the NFC South. Uh, this is Tom Brady's debut. Uh, the, kind of everyone expects these to be the top two teams in their division. Um, what are you thinking about this game? Yeah, look, I think both defenses are better than people give them credit for. Um, if this were a normal environment, you know, if this if we had a normal August, we had four preseason games. We knew the defenses were more cohesive than what, you know, I was talking earlier about how they might not be together and gel well chemistry wise. If that were the case, I would probably feel really good about the under in this game. But because, you know, you're facing you have Tom Brady and Drew Brees. We know they're both very, very skilled quarterbacks. We know both teams have a lot of weapons and we know that there are question marks uh, on the defensive side of the ball across the NFL because of that, the, the lack of reps that they got. Um, I can understand going the under here. Uh, and and I, I like the Saints more in this game, too. Um, they're just a more complete team. They still have their home environment, which I still think matters, especially when you're playing in a dome. Um, I, I just think there are fewer question marks across that team. Tampa Bay's defense is improved. And during the second half of last year, they were way better than people gave them credit for. Um, but I think there's just a, there, there's going to be some growing pains in general with this Tampa Bay team. Um, and so since they're facing what I consider probably the favorite in the NFC, or at least one of the favorites in the Saints, uh, I, I lean the Saints with the three and a half points. And we've had a lot of people, Aaron Schatz and Football Outsiders echoed that sentiment on the Saints being an NFC contender or the favorite to win the NFC and a Super Bowl legitimate team. Now, you talked about the chemistry with the Bucks, and it's not just them undergoing changes. Are you worried about other teams that have had big changes in the offseason, transitioning, heading into week one with no preseason and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that you have to, especially, again, on the defensive side. You know, there, there are some units, like Pittsburgh, for instance, is basically the exact same defense year over year. So you can feel good about Pittsburgh going up against the, the Giants in week one um, and, and what we're going to see from that defensive unit. But, you know, there are a ton of, of teams that, that saw a massive turnover on the defensive side. I mean, you look at a team like Carolina, for instance, 
where they're not only starting a bunch of rookies and unproven players, uh, so they should probably not be very good defensively, <laughs> but the whole defense is just completely different. Um, and so as a result of that, yeah, I'm going to favor, you know, the offense in general in here in week one, but then on top of that, without that, that chemistry, of course, I'm going to go inside with Derek Carr, which I never thought that I would say, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there are instances like that, that I wouldn't lean that way, just given, you know, the, the, the uh, lack of continuity on both sides of the ball. Yeah, Carolina has issues on multiple levels. We'll leave yeah. that there for sure. Uh, so let's talk about the rest of week one. Are you seeing any other value on the board here for week number one based on the current numbers of FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, shocker. I like two more overs uh, on, <laughs> on, this, on this slate. Uh, one of them has has moved a, a good bit since it opened. I mean, it opened a pretty, pretty low number, all things considered. But the Cowboys-Rams game, I think, could be a serious, serious shootout. Uh, because you're looking at, again, two good offenses. That's that's great. Um, you know, the the Rams had some growing pains last year because the offensive line switched up and changed. I know it's your boy, Jim, Jared Goff. but uh, <laughs> Not his know, fault. It's the offensive line's fault. Yes, Never yes. Jared's fault. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, you, you have to feel good about the Rams' offense in general. I mean, oh, since Sean McVay's gotten there, uh, only the Saints and Chiefs have scored more touchdowns than the Rams have across the NFL. So the Rams should be scoring points. We know the Cowboys are are arguably have a they probably have a top two offense in the league right now. Um, so there should be a lot of scoring naturally. But also last season, the Rams and Cowboys both ranked in the top three in neutral script uh, uh, pace. So they're going to run at a fast pace, too. I think that just sets up for an over, even though that game continues to climb with that over under. I think it opened at like forty nine and a half or something really, really stupid, stupid low. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I love that game uh, hitting the over. I also really like the Cardinals 49ers game. Uh, last year, they averaged like 57 points per game. The two, the two times that they faced each other, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo actually had his two best outings, at least in terms of fantasy points scored against Arizona. And we're scared about the San Francisco defense. I get it. Um, they likely won't be as good as they were last year, just given some personnel changes, but then also defenses aren't very sticky year over year in terms of data um, stickiness. So in, in correlation, uh, but Kyler Murray uh, dominant, I mean, he played really well against San Francisco last year. So I feel pretty good about that. Uh, so I would not be surprised if both of those offenses are able to click and, and work well. And then we see an over, I feel like the 47 and a half is just a little bit low. Yeah, the Cowboys-Rams game. I think the Rams are just going to be an over machine to start because their defense is going to suck. Yeah. Like, they lost a lot of legitimate, you know, you know, a lot of legitimate pieces. Sure, it's a full year of Jalen Ramsey, full year of Aaron Donald once again. But, like, they lost a lot of guys and Wade Phillips. And that offense can – they can – they can do some magic, you know, they, they've got that fast pace, like you alluded to, and they should be more efficient with that offensive line uh, being healthier than it was. So I agree, just kind of blindly bet the over for all Rams totals, given the way that like, I think they and the Panthers are going to be the two over yeah. machines to open the season, at least based yeah. on the way things shape up there. And I also like the Panthers Raiders game too. I think that's another yeah. game that could easily go over. That one's already gone up. That was uh, a yeah. point of discussion on covering the future a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was 46 and a half then. I think it's 47 and a half now. Yep. So hoping it goes up a little bit more. Wouldn't mind additional value there. But should be a fun. Anytime we can get some overs, we will always take that for sure. That is JJ Zacharyson. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Late Round QB. Check out all of his work over at numberfire.com and on the Late Round podcast. JJ, thanks once again. Hopefully things had a, hit at the similar rate this time as they did the last time. And we are looking forward to having you on once again soon. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Covering the future. One final big thank you to J.J. Zacharyson, J.J. Zacharyson for swinging by and breaking down week number one of the NFL. Follow J.J. on Twitter at Late Round QB And Ed, uh, it's not just J.J. talking about the overs in week number one. My colleague Brandon Gadula went back and researched that 2011 season, and it was week, the first five weeks the overs hit at a pretty consistent rate. But I can also, like, if you look at the the totals on the board right now they're not necessarily low so i find it interesting yeah. to try to decide how we want to play things for this week yeah no i mean there's not like too many uh totals like under 44 right i mean you definitely right. have jets and bills at 39 and a half which how dare they disrespect sam darnold versus josh allen <laughs> the josh allen show season three <laughs> yes gonna be good and what could go wrong <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong exactly but yeah i think i mean i think the markets do have you know some some pretty high totals so it'll be interesting to see if uh you know we get points in excess to what the markets expect 
Yep, absolutely. I'm going to talk about an under in my covering the future, so maybe we'll cross our fingers and pray for that one. But first, Ed, let's start off with you. You've been doing the pick report, doing a lot of research into quarterback play, and I think that's led to some interesting takeaways for you. You want to focus on that here for covering the future for today. Who have you been digging into this week uh, that you find interesting? Yeah, I mean, I actually, I, I really like the win totals market right now. Um, and, you know, one of the teams is Houston. And so first, let's talk about all the reasons you might be down on this team and this franchise. They traded away DeAndre Hopkins, one of the league's best wide receivers. Uh, last year, they actually allowed seven more points than they scored. Uh, so negative point differential. Uh, it was an 8-3 and three record in one-score games that, that helped them to a 10-6 to a and six, uh, regular season record. And then, uh, you know, they... they come out of the gate going to Arrowhead and Kansas City, and then they'll play Baltimore in week two. So right out of the gate, they're playing the two best teams in the league. But they do have a key asset, and his name's Deshaun Watson. So he's one of the you know youngest, most mobile, and most accurate quarterbacks in the NFL. And Houston uh, you know, recently signed him to a, a long-term deal with $110 million in guaranteed money. I also found some things to like uh, even more about Watson. Um, so over the past three years, he's had an interception rate of 2.3%, which is slightly below the NFL average of 2.4% uh, over this time. But, you know, the work I did um, this summer was all about how, how can we predict interceptions even better? And one of the things I found out was that bad ball rate is a very important statistic. So you define this by taking interceptions plus passes defended. So basically anytime a defender gets a hand on the ball or jars the ball loose with a hit. So interceptions plus passes defended divided by attempts. And when you look at this for quarterbacks, you know, not only is it really sticky from season to season, um, but that's usually the best way to predict interceptions going forward. And what you find with Deshaun Watson is that he has a bad ball rate of 8.9%, which is significantly less than the NFL average of 11.3%. Of so that suggests that Houston could be doing even better in the turnover department this season. And so I just think there's a very high floor for Houston as long as they have Deshaun Watson and he stays healthy. Uh, you know, I'm not super high on their defense, but, you know, they're certainly better than what Seattle's defense was last year. And if you remember, you know, Seattle and Russell Wilson had a market win total of eight and a half uh, heading into the 2019 season. Um, you know, and, and I think Houston's defense could be just with the upside that J.J. Watt brings uh, if he's healthy. I like Houston over seven and a half wins. I think they get to eight at least. Um, you got to remember that, you know, despite the difficulty of that opening two games, they, they have two games against Jacksonville, which is going to be pretty nice. Um, you know, not exactly the, the toughest division down there either. So um, Houston over seven and a half. I like that too. And I think that Deshaun Watson is a really fun topic because – you've kind of seen him progress in like very measurable ways. Cause in college he was obviously tremendous, like yep. national champion, uh, Dabo compared him to Michael Jordan, stuff like that. He was tremendous, but he had an issue with picks and he threw a lot of interceptions at Clemson. But like you said, he hasn't done that in the NFL and there's a potential for this interception rate to get even lower. So he's improved in that arena. But we've also seen improvements for him from a sack perspective. And part of that's because Having Laramie Tunsil will improve that, but as Dr. Eric Eager has shown, quarterbacks play a heavy hand in influencing sacks as well. And Deshaun Watson last year, even when Tunsil missed time, um, they had uh, Titus Howard missed time too, they had injuries at both tackle positions, Deshaun Watson kind of just like stopped taking sacks. So that's why I think that having faith in a Deshaun Watson-led team is probably not going to lead you astray that often because he's been great ever since his college days, but even the imperfections that he does have are things that have gotten better as he has gone along. And this is still just year four, I believe, with this guy, which is wild to think about, but it's fun to watch a player who is already very good show tangible improvements in important areas of his game, you know, cutting out the interceptions from college, cutting down the sacks. And I think that makes him really interesting. That's why, like, I never talked about it on the show, but I do think that Houston's an interesting bet in the AFC South because we've made a punching bag out of Bill O'Brien, but like you said, it's not the toughest division. Like, the Colts and the Titans are fine, but they're not the most imposing teams by any no, means. No, exactly. No, yeah. and I think we're, you know, I mean, I can I can envision some regression for Ryan Tannehill. In oh, Tennessee very easily. Year. I can envision that very well, yes. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it, it's not a division that scares you, right? Like, right. No one wakes up and is like, hey, played in this division. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to go back and look at his college interceptions. Um, it's a lot. So you remember, I think it was the, the game that Alabama beat Clemson. Uh, Nick Saban was so scared of Deshaun Watson that he actually onside kicked in that game. Yeah. And kept talking about how, you know, Deshaun Watson could put it in such a small window. Mm -hmm. So the accuracy has always been there. Um, Don't know what happened with the picks in college. Uh, Could potentially be better in the NFL than than even what we've seen. And that is, uh, you know, that that that's a scary thought. Texans are plus 320 to win the AFC South. Just going to throw that out there. Never know what could happen. Never bet against Deshaun Watson. That's been a, a good creed thus far. For my cover in the future, I want to go against everything we have discussed with regards to overs in week number one and talk about an under. Now, I did get my over in earlier because we talked about the Panthers and the Raiders, the over there. It's gone up to 47 and a half. So that's the fun route. If you want to go an over, I still do like that one, even at 47 and a half. But if we're going to have some less fun, let's talk about the Seahawks versus the Falcons. I want the under in this game. It's currently at 49 and a half, which is the third highest total of the week. And it makes sense. Both teams have explosive players on offense. We got Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley. The list goes on in addition to that Russell Wilson guy. There are a lot of great players in this game. And there is a chance the Seahawks may let Russell Wilson cook this year. Let Russ cook. They might do that. That would definitely help an over in this game. But this is not a particularly fast game. The Seahawks were 24th in situation neutral pace last year. That is according to Football Outsiders. That would go up if they were to pass more, but that's never a guarantee. Because we talked about Russ Russ throwing more often in the past. Has not happened as of yet. The Falcons were 9th in situation neutral pace. And Dirk Cutter does tend to go decently fast, but it's not some, some super fast game by any means. And we also, I think could see a bit more defense out of both these teams this year. The Seahawks traded for Jamal Adams, and he is a legitimate difference maker. And I think that at least helps mitigate the loss of Jadavian Clowney. I'd rather have Jamal Adams than Jadavian Clowney personally, but um, I think they're both valuable members, and at least Jamal Adams will offset the Clowney loss. The Falcons signed Dante Fowler Jr. in free agency. He seemed to get right last year, get his career back on track with the Rams. That could help them generate a pass rush, and the Seahawks are going to be pretty weak at right tackle. I don't honestly know what they're doing at right tackle. It could be a disaster. They focused on defense the first two rounds in the draft. Both the Falcons and the Eagles did, so adding additional names there, you can question the players they picked with those picks, but they did go defense there to try to improve the talent, so... This game is fun because of the players involved in it. There are a lot of big names who can score touchdowns in a hurry, and it's also indoors, which is great for offense. But the defenses may take steps forward this year, and if that does happen, it's pretty easy to see a scenario where this game does hit the under. The under here is minus 120, but it's already shifted to 48 and a half in a couple of books. So make sure you shop around, go to oddsfire.com, try to search for the best line you can get and make sure you're getting the best number. But with it at 49 and a half at FanDuel, I am good riding with the under here. I agree with what we said for the most part about overs being the better play in week number one. I just think this one's gone a bit too high. So I do want to play it situationally, take the under here at 49 and a half for the Seahawks and the Panthers. Ed, any thoughts for you on that game between, or sorry, Seahawks and the, the Falcons. Any thoughts for you on that one? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's it's interesting to me just because the Seahawks are going to be on the road, uh, but probably have the edge of the quarterback position, um, you know, maybe on defense with Jamal Adams as well. They are a favorite uh point and a half i think my numbers suggest it should be a little bit more um but again you know you're you're traveling across the country uh playing in a a a much different time zone there so we talked about uh what you were going to do with your home field stuff did you wind up settling on one point for home field i know that was what we had discussed yeah you might do right now i have a one point uh in the nfl and uh you know we'll make adjustments as we go although uh, obviously it's just it's a very small sample size uh, in the NFL. Um, so yeah, but there's definitely more analysis to be done there and, uh, hopefully I'll get to that soon. And you're going to have more data coming up on Thursday and on Sunday and on Monday. So it is a beautiful day to be a sports fan. That is going to be a whole lot of fun and we're looking forward to it. That is all the time that we have for today here on covering the spread. Ed, uh, give us a final pump here for the pick report. People can find that and consume all that good info. Yeah, for sure. The pick report is 
my off season long research about predicting interceptions and what are the best numbers to in which to do that. Um, uh, I, I talk about players like Carson Wentz. Uh, I talked about Deshaun Watson here, um, but there's a PDF, there's an audio book, there's a data file, uh, which will help you find vi- value with quarterbacks in which, you know, their projected picks and, and their actual picks are off. Uh, you can get that all at the powerrank.info. It's a URL that'll take you uh, to a place where you can check out the pick report. It's also available to members of my site. So go to the powerrank.net and uh, that'll take you to my site as well. And then also, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk to JJ too much about how he constructs his models. I had him on the Football Analytics Show earlier this month to talk about that. So if you're interested in that, uh, I would highly recommend checking it out. Uh, I feel like often, you know, we we tend to have JJ on to talk about games and spreads, and he's obviously very good and knowledgeable yeah. about that as well. But it was really fun to, to dig into his bre- bread and butter with season-long fantasy football, um, which obviously applies to, to player props as well. Uh, but to really get into the weeds of of something that he's been consistently doing for a very long time, yeah, and the methods and how he builds it from team to player, um, the art versus science. So check that out at the Football Analytics Show. Yeah, the Football Analytics Show for more from JJ. The PowerRank.info to get uh, the pick report, whether it be audio or written form, and I would recommend it. It is a fun listen. I listen to the audio version because I am lazy, and uh, definitely oh, would recommend you. that for sure. I just don't, you know, I like to listen to things during lunch. I like to make it I, easy on myself. I still need to send you the PDF because there's a bunch of nice figures in there. You sent me the the PDF. I have that. Oh, oh okay. Because I was looking at it like today, actually, because I was looking at stuff for week one. I was kind of checking out some stuff. So I do nice. have that. So, yeah, we are all set there. But I, I think the audio version for sure is a big supplement for sure. The PowerRank.info to get the pick, or, pick report. Make sure you follow Ed on Twitter as well, at the PowerRank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to JJ Zacharyson for swinging by and spreading his knowledge for week number one and player props. Find JJ on Twitter at the late round QB and also check out the, or at late round QB and check out the late round podcast wherever you get your podcast. Big thank you as well to Kevin Theobald, our video producer. Thank you, Cal, as always, for keeping us on the air and editing the video side for things for today. And finally, thank you to those of you, the listeners, who stuck with us throughout the offseason through a literal pandemic and tuned in to Covering the Spread. We'll be back with you every week to get you set for the NFL, so make sure you are subscribed. Good luck with your bets in Week 1. We'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>